will have that rare chance to record history as it was made. One photographer has special ties to China's last 40 years of reform and opening up. Meet Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Liu Xiangzheng. History is remembered not as thick tone, but a series of flashpoints. Photographers, therefore, are significant messengers, particularly when they capture a moment in time and help us form a collective memory of the history. China's reform and opening up over the past four decades has brought changes at a dizzying speed. Blink and you'll miss it. But thanks to the works of photographers like Liu Xiangcheng and his peers, the Chinese can still gauge where everything started with all the struggles, confusion, excitement and success frozen in time. When he first arrived in China, the Hong Kong-born Chinese-American Liu was the only Western photographer based in China. Instead of focusing on the grand schemes like his Chinese counterparts did then, he was fascinated and later well known for capturing the real lives of the Chinese and making fascinating analogies of them through visual language. I spent a Saturday morning with him in Beijing recently and was wonderfully overwhelmed by his stories through photos. You are very good at photographing young people, particularly at the very beginning of China's reform and opening up. Not just them, but the also three gentlemen in sunglasses. Yes. That's quite an iconic photo. Yes, it was taken in, in Yunnan province, which borders with Thailand. And, and one day I went down there to, to you know, photograph the water festival, which is an annual festival of the Thai uh, people that follows uh, the solar calendar. And, and in the distance, I saw these three men, you know, wandering and towards, <laughs> towards me. And I said, gee, you know, there is th this perception of Chinese look alike. And there they are, look exactly alike. <laughs> so they walked towards me and I walked towards them. And, and the result was that photograph. I remember there was a photo about Beijing during the winter time the Chinese cabbage, a whole truck of it being thrown back and forth. And certainly that is the food, the only vegetable, together with potato, that the Chinese could rely on throughout the winter, almost four or five months. And that was such a vivid photo. You could almost hear the sound of the Chinese cabbage being flied around. Yes. Uh, how did you catch that moment? That photograph was taken, you know, this, this truck just, just rolled down the field and then on both sides the people harvesting the cabbage and, and load it onto the truck and you know I tried it myself oh, I, I couldn't do it <laughs> it, it looks it looks so easy, easy yeah. but, but each of these cabbage weighs like around you know 20 kilo absolutely it's, it's one thing to move it side by side but to, to, to throw it up and land it properly takes a lot of skills so, and also I love the idea that, you know, the cabbage, four or five of them in the air. Mm -hmm. It was like a, it was like a symphony. It's it was like, like a, a symphony and an air show. It's a musical note for Beijing residents at that time. I will visit Chinese people's home in the, in the stairway, in the corridor, Everywhere. in the corners of the living room, just piles with this cabbage. Now you see the so-called street photography is so vibrant here in China. Mm -hmm. But people also ask about the styles. There used to be styles more influenced by the former Soviet Union, and now it seems the style have been switching very different from their time, probably getting closer to your style, or styles of so-called Western photographers. There's a bit of a cultural differences in this reg regard. Um, Chinese people in general um, they don't wear the emotion on the face, so to speak. There was one couple, they sit together, they chit chat, and their, their, their legs and feet were touching each other. I think a Western photographer would pass right by that, Im that, that image. But many Chinese uh, look at their photograph, they respond to it. Right. They say, well, this is more kind of um, 
the Chinese word is more han shu, it's more indirect. Indirect, it's more, you know, it's kind of not in your face. Photography does certain things very, very well, and that is to project emotion and, 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 and display your empathy to people, to people you photograph, to, to people you observe. And I think to do that, the photographer has to, has to be more direct in some way. And because you can always look at a photograph, look at the subject's eyes, the eyes convey a lot of information. Right? You take a portrait, how, how does the, per, the, the person sitting in the portrait look at you, at your camera, tells you a lot of information. I also noticed that you follow people. You follow people into their lives, not just about one photo, but rather try to get to know what is the context of that one photo that you are taking. For example, a young lady who is wearing maybe a Dior bra or something, uh, very fashionable, and the onlookers are all interestingly surprised to put the list. And you followed her to her home. She also had a photo standing in the little room she had. That is a very interesting contrast about realities yes. and aspirations. Yes, and she's a very tall model. She must be about 6'2". And that photograph of her, you know, stooping in the, in the, in the room serve as both the bedroom and the living room. Um, give us a real sense of what is daily life look like. You know, there is this one photograph, she's, she's in the splendor of Dior, a beautiful white bra. Is that daily life matters. For example, um, every time I describe the photographs to the friends um, in the West, they all laugh. There was this photograph, the early, earliest days of Chinese women having a plastic you know, surgery done. And she only had one eye done first. And, and I didn't understand and you can't that. So I asked them, <laughs> I can say, how come this eye is double eyelid and this eye is your original eyes? She said, well, if I have the both done, I cannot go home on a bicycle. <laughs> because she will be both covered, so she can't go home. And that, you know, it says so much about China and that period of the daily life. So, so, um, and, and fast forward or backward if you like, in 40 years, you might as well look at China of 200 years. The difference is just stark difference. China's reform and opening up was monumental in its own sense. But in retrospect, it is also part of the global changes in progress during the 1970s and 1980s. Liu Xiangcheng did not miss any of them. His photos depicting the very last days of former Soviet Union won him the Pulitzer Prize for that year. As an experienced journalist, he tried to be cool-minded when history was revealing itself in front of him. But as an individual, he was just like every one of us, overwhelmed by how fast the world transformed. In my conversation with him, we zoomed in to those stories and afterthoughts. You catch that moment. Every one of your peers was so jealous of you about that moment. Tell us what exactly is that moment. One day in the afternoon, I remember uh, in, the, in the 1991, uh, when I first arrived in, in Moscow, um, I received a call on my, on my portable phone. In those days, our portable phone is this big <laughs> because it has to be patched to AT&T in New York and come back. So I pick up the phone and it was a call from Tom Johnson, uh, chairman of CNN. Say, said, HS, um, you know, are you busy this evening? I said, well, doesn't call me every day. <laughs> and I said, sure, you know, I'm available. He said, okay, meet me at 7, 7 p.m. at, at Spassky Gate at, at the Kremlin. So I duly show up. I didn't realize that, that CNN and Tom Johnson had negotiated a deal with the Kremlin, with uh, Mr. Gorbachev, that CNN would be the first one to interview him. 
I was already very surprised that I was the only photographer. Wow. That was no you got an exclusive. And so that the time came, I said, well, my best spot would be to sit in front of the tripod and looking at Gorbachev like I look at you now. And so there was a KGB guard standing next to the cameraman. And he was benign. He was well, you know, good-hearted. He said, you know, your shutter, camera shutter, would would interfere with the, with with live broadcast. And please do not take any photographs. I said, fair enough. It's a very legitimate uh, request. So as I sat in front of the tri tripod, I saw him reading one page, two page, and I said, oh, there's only one page left. And I thought to myself, this, when he throw down this page, that will be the end of history, so to speak. I said, how can I not do anything then? But I knew very well if I, if I do anything earlier, it would be just a picture of the speech or you know, look like a press conference picture. It wouldn't go anywhere. So I said, OK, I wanted to take a big risk. I want to slow down my shutter speed to 30 of a second because I want him to fold down the paper and I want to see the paper's movement because that was the moment the Soviet Union ceased to exist. That would be the end of the Soviet Union. So as he throw down the last, about to throw down the last page of his speech, I pick up my camera, I made a one frame. Right. So just at that moment, the KGB guard throw me a punch through the tripod. And Tom Johnson was you know, standing on the right side of Gorbachev, was, was communicating with me with his eyes, say, are you OK? And I said, I'm fine. So when, and then he gave his Mont Blanc pen to Gorbachev, and he signed his resignation. And that was the moment, you know, the history of Soviet Union. And you caught every second of it. When I rushed out, you know, I saw the red carpet of the Kremlin. I run and I run. And then, and I saw all the Western journalists, <laughs> hundreds of them. They're waiting. And I rushed down to the Spassky Gate in the Red Square. And the Russian flag was going up. And the Soviet Union flag was coming down. So the next day, I guess he fronted many, many newspapers, front page around the world. Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Liu Xiangcheng tells his stories. Making records of history through camera lens, Liu Xiangcheng has won worldwide recognition. But as an individual, always with a curious mind and always ready to take on new challenges, how does he get his fix? A walk with him in one of his favorite Beijing haunts, the ancient Beihai Park, gives away the answers. You were interacting with the grandmas and the grandpas who are dancing in the park. Yes. Do they tell you much about the real China stories? I think they do, uh, very much in fact, because China that I know has moved since the, you know, the late 1970s when the reform began from very much a collective society to now as the, the ladies in the park you see, <laughs> they really enjoy a much more individualistic style yeah. that they dance, they laugh, uh, they chit chat with their friends. Mm. With the rhythmic music. And, and the people we met there from Yunnan province. Mm -hmm. So, you know, domestic travel, international travel, China has, has moved to, to a point mm. that is unrecognizable. Mm. This is only a very quiet and a very special corner of Beijing. And of course, this city has changed so much. Bicycles, cars, but that's on the surface. Mm. The gene in people's way of thinking. Have things changed much? Where is it going? I remember in 1978 when I first uh, became resident of Beijing, uh, I felt if I, if I travel past the second ring road, I am I'm heading towards Hebei province. <laughs> but today, as you know, um, you know, China is up to six ring roads.
I think it is very, it's very difficult to envision the speed of the of the development in China without understanding how the first 30 years versus the second 30 years, you know, the first three decades and and the, and the second three decades. In fact, I think people felt they have lost time and they want to make up. And some of the things very is very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of parents, they felt they have lost the opportunity to to education, and now they go in very big time to make sure their kids are well educated. Mm -hmm. So to catch up. Uh, to catch up, and and this is really the speed that the world are still adjusting to. We are in this royal garden in a way, Beihai Park. Mm -hmm. The beautiful pagodas in the distance. Um, this reminds us a lot about traditional Chinese culture in a way. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, China embraces the world. On the other hand, there's so much in China's history, just as many other civilizations, that the people now could get inspirations from. Mm -hmm. But that is also a beautiful balance. Mm -hmm. And that is also a selective process about exactly what do you get inspiration from, about what. Mm -hmm. So, um, HS, your thought about that, I'm sure you have been thinking about it 20 years walking around this park. <laughs> well, Beihe Park, as you know, is a, it used to be an imperial park of the, of the Chinese emperors. Um, I think it, uh, in the world we, we talk about artificial intelligence and all this uh, scientific uh, breakthrough is very, very important for us to to look back at, at the history and feel reassured about the merit of this civilization. Mm. At the same time, Chinese people also keep talking about how you uh, engage with the world, how you join the world. So while you look back uh, as a source of comfort, you must also look forward. Uh, and that's oft oftentimes a challenge, mm. I think. It's a challenge, I, I have to emphasize, it is universally true. Mm. A lot of food for thought, what you have just said. But it's a beautiful morning and the birds are singing. <laughs> I don't want to delay you too much from your enjoy yourself here in Beijing. So let's go and take a look. Please do, let me grab okay. my camera. Okay, of course. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us on our website, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine. You'll be able to find us or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, bye for now. And we hope you're having a great Lunar New Year.